So yesterday I had started chapter three and um, as usual I had some technical difficulties and so most of the way through chapter three I got cut off. Go figure. So we're going to stick with the same question we had yesterday in the Apothecary. What is your impression of St. Benedict's school? That's what we're focused on. Um, and Dash is settling in for the story. Let's see. So we heard about Janie being introduced by Mr. Danby, and he was talking about reciting. Um, and then I'm going to start back on the top of page 23 for you. I looked at the two Latin sentences he had written on the chalkboard, one long and one short, both incomprehensible. I gathered my things slowly, putting off my next trial. Miss Scott, Mr. Danby said as the last students filed up, I take it you don't feel comfortable with Latin. I've never studied it before, I said, clutching my books as a shield. Mr. Danby looked at the chalkboard and read, Vivendi resti qui rogate horam rustica expectant dum de fluta amnis. He who delays the hour of living rightly is like the rustic who waits for the river to run out. And I'm sorry, my Latin is atrocious. So that was just my guessing. I tried to sort the Latin words into anything like that meaning. I was nervous, but Mr. Danby reminded me of some of my parents' friends, the ones who talked to me as if I was a full-fledged person and not just a child. Somehow, I summoned the courage to ask him, what's a rustic? In this case, it's a fool who won't cross the river until the water is gone. And the second one, Disiempimur siepe resti, he said. We are deceived by the appearance of right. You see why I put the two together. I hazarded it, I guess, encouraged by his assumption that I did see. Because you can't always know what it means to live rightly. Exactly, he said, smiling. They taught you something in the wilds of California. How are you finding St. Bendon's? I tried to think of something nice, or at least neutral, to <clears throat> say, my mother said moving here would be like living in a Jane Austen novel, but it isn't really. But your story couldn't be Austen with an American heroine, he said. I couldn't help smiling at him. That's what I said. More of a Henry James novel, he said, The American Girl Abroad. Are you an Isabel Archer or a Daisy Miller? I blushed, but I told the truth. I don't know. I haven't read any Henry James novels. You will soon enough he said, but you wouldn't want to be a Isabel or Daisy. They come to bad ends, those girls. Confidi tibi, Miss Scott. Far better to be who you are. That conversation with Mr. Danby was the high point of the morning. I was lost in history. They were studying medieval battles and kings I'd never heard of, and in math, which was a confusing sort of geometry and which they bafflingly called maths. At lunch, I stood with my tray full of unappetizing food, surveying the lunchroom. It wasn't easy to be who you were if you were the awkward new girl at a strange school. At the end of one of the long, old-fashioned tables, Sergi Shishkin was sitting alone. He was the only student I knew by name who'd been somewhat nice. So I sat at the other end of his empty table, and we nodded to each other with the recognition of outcasts. I wondered why I hadn't just sat right across from him, but it was too late for that. Sarah Pennington sashayed past, and I tried to come up with a smile for her. At the Bolshevik table, are we? she asked. Her gang of girls, none as pretty as she was, of course, followed her, giggling. I knew Bolsheviks were Russian communists, and I looked at my tray to keep my composure, but that was no help. The meat looked like it had been boiled. There was a small piece of rationed gray bread with no butter and not even an old margarine. I was pushing the potatoes around with my fork when a startlingly loud long alarm went off. Bomb drill, one of the lunch ladies called, coming along the long tables. Under the tables, please. It was duck and cover English style. Sergi and I both got under the long table, and everyone in the lunchroom pushed back their benches and did the same. 
Everyone, that is, except one boy. He was at the next table, over, and he sat calmly where he was, eating his lunch. From my place on the floor, I could see the lunch lady in her white uniform approach. Mr. Burroughs, she said, get under the table, please. No, he said, I won't. His eyes were serious and intent, and his hair didn't flop limply over his eyes like so many of the, other, of the boys' hairs did, but grew back from his forehead in sandy waves, leaving his face exposed and defiant. The knot of his tie was pushed off to the side as if it got in his way. Do you want an engraved invitation? The lunch lady asked with her hands on her hips. It's idiotic, he said. I won't do it. I'm sure you were wetting your nappies out in the country during the blitz, the woman said. But some of us were in London, and a bomb drill is not a time to play at rebellion. The sandy-haired boy leaned toward her across the lunch table. I wasn't in the country, he said. I was here. And we both know that these tables would have done nothing against bombs. Not the V1, not the V2, not even the smaller ones dropped by planes. The lunch lady frowned. I'll be forced to give you a merit, Benjamin. But this, was, is, but this isn't even a V2 we're talking about, he said. This is an atom bomb. When it comes, not even the basement shelters will save us. We'll all be incinerated, the whole city. Our flesh will burn, then we will turn to ash. He's cheery, isn't he? The woman had lost the color in her face, but her voice still had its commanding ring. Two demerits. But the boy, Benjamin Burroughs, was making a speech now for the benefit of the whole lunchroom. He had a thrilling, defiant voice to go with his thrilling, defiant face. That is, of course, he said, assuming we're lucky enough to be near the point of impact. For the children in the country, it will be slower and much, much more painful. Stop, she said. A short bell rang to signal the end of the drill, and people climbed out from under the tables. But I stayed where I was. I wanted to watch Benjamin Burroughs a little longer without being seen. I was terrified by what he had said, but moved by his defiance. I tried to sort out whether it was the terror or the excitement that was making my heart beat inside my ribcage at such an unexpected pace. All right, well, we've been introduced to another character, um, a defiant character, wildly defiant. I wonder what that will mean for us um, and what his role will be in um, getting us to understand Jamie better. Remember that I wanted you to think of what is your impression of St. Fendon's School? We have met Sarah Pennington. We have met uh, Mr. Danby. We have met Sergi Shishkin. We have met the lunch lady, or at least seen how she interacts with students. And we have now met Mr. Burroughs. So, on that note, look forward to your thoughts on that. I will catch you with, I think we're on to chapter four. Let me just double check. Yes, chapter four, spies. Okay, catch you tomorrow. Bye.